Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great honor to be here speaking at home. Uh, so this talk is joint work with Jeffrey Galkowski, and it's about AM functions of the Laplacian. So I'm going to start introducing what the setting is. So we are going to be working on a compact Riemannian manifold. So M, and the dimension of the manifold, if I ever refer to it, is little n. So this is a compact manifold, no boundary, smooth. And we are going to, on the manifold, on the L2 space over the manifold, you have the Laplacian acting. The manifold for us is going to be compact. Let's see, there. The manifold is going to be compact, so the Laplacian, when it acts on the manifold, uh, it has discrete spectrum. And it can only accumulate at infinity. And the notation that I'm going to use, so this is the, the Laplacian, and the eigenfunctions are going to be denoted by phi lambda, and the eigenvalues are going to be lambda square. But this is just a sequence of discrete eigenvalues. They are accumulating at infinity, so in, real, in reality these are lambda j's. I usually, I am going to omit this of index, okay? But this is a discrete sequence of eigenfunctions, and it's accumulating at infinity. And throughout the talk, we are going to take these eigenfunctions to be normalized in L2. So, the L2 norm of all these eigenfunctions, I'm going to prescribe it to E1. And if you're not used to working with eigenfunctions, the way you should think of them, um, or one way of thinking of them is to use the quantum mechanics per perspective. So if what you do is you fix a point in the manifold and you evaluate the eigenfunction at the point, and what you do is you go and measure the absolute value squared, then what you get is that this is the probability of finding a quantum particle of energy lambda squared, so the eigenvalue, at the point x. This is how you should think of the eigenfunctions. That's the information that they are giving you. So this is the probability of finding your particle, your quantum particle of energy lambda, energy lambda squared at the point x. Okay, so this is the information that they are giving us. And uh, the idea, this is just the same line, only that I wanted to keep it, uh, to use it later. The idea is that uh, we want to relate, understand how the behavior of this eigen function is affected depending on the metric that you put on the manifold. So we want to know how they respond to the different uh, dynamical systems that you can create on the base manifold M. And uh, from a numerical point of view, we have a lot of evidence that eigenfunctions res respond to uh, dynamics of the manifold. And I'm just going to try to convince you with a picture here. So here you have a disk or a cardio. And in red, what you have is just the billiard trajectory of a particle that you kick with some initial position and momentum. And, uh, and what I'm going to show you next is the plot of four different eigenfunctions. So the eigenvalue is growing like this, okay? And uh, what you can see is that on the disk, <coughs> uh, where the billiard trajectory was quite nice, uh, the eigenfunctions also look nice. They are responding to the geometry, to all the symmetries that you have in the disk. And for example, here, I mean, you know that the trajectory was avoiding the center of the disk. And in these four pictures, the way in which you should read this information is that you are seeing the density plots of this absolute value here. Black means that the eigenfunction is highly concentrated there. White means that the eigenfunction is almost zero. So what these eigenfunctions are telling you is that these quantum particles uh, correspond to the energies that are given in each of these um, uh, plots is that at the center of the disk, for example, you will never find uh, your quantum particle of energy, whichever you're looking at. So the probability of being uh, close to the center of the disk is zero in all of them. If you look at what happens in the cardio, the picture is quite different because the billiard trajectory is chaotic. And the eigenfunctions, they are, also, they are capturing this information. Uh, the only symmetry that you are able to see in this, fun uh, in this plot for the eigenfunctions is the symmetry with respect to this axis, the horizontal axis. But other than that, the plot looks quite chaotic. And uh, if you were to plot more and more eigenfunctions, let the eigenvalue grow to infinity in this direction, you could picture that what you would see is that uh, the cardio would start looking evenly gray, 
And what that means is that the probability of finding your quantum particle in a certain region in your cardioid is simply the area of that region. That's what you would get. Um, so the idea is to try to understand how these eigenfunctions are concentrated uh, across the manifold. And we are going to try to input different geometric conditions on the manifold and see how the eigenfunctions respond to these conditions. Now, the way in which we are going to phrase the question is to grab a submanifold H inside M. And we are going to average these eigenfunctions, phi lambda, along H. So I just want to integrate these functions on H with respect to the volume form that my Riemannian metric induces on the submanifold H. And the idea is to try to understand how these averages behave. That's going to be the focus of this talk. Um, these eigenfunctions, they are oscillating like crazy. They are going up and down, and they, and they are doing this with frequencies that are like 1 over lambda. So the eigenvalue is lambda squared. They go up and down, and these intervals are like 1 over lambda close. So the larger the, your eigenvalue, the more they go, they go up and down. So when you... What you should expect of these averages is that they should go to zero, that this cancellation, you should have cancellations along H. But this is not going to be the case always, actually. So I'm, I'm going to start the talk giving you an example where these averages do not go to zero. We are going to take that as our enemy. We are going to try to build intuition of why is it that that's happening and try to discard that. Uh, but before I do that, what I wanted to do is to mention the case in which H is just a point which we are going to allow in this talk. In, when you do this, you are just getting information on the value of your function at the point x. And I'm saying this because towards the end of the talk, uh, the talk is going to turn into a understanding what are the value distributions of these functions, what's the supremum value that these functions can take, depending on the point x that we will choose. And uh, towards the end, the conditions are going to sound like if I'm not a point x that is self-conjugate with maximal um, rank, then uh, I'm going to be able to control the supremum. But before we get into that, I want to talk about the enemy, which is I'm going to do it on the two torus. So the square flat torus, think of it as um, the square that's 0 to pi by 0 to pi. So here we are identifying opposite sides. And the sequence of eigenfunctions functions that you're going to build on the torus to give you an average that doesn't go to 0 looks like this. So when you evaluate it at the point x1, x2, you simply do e to the i lambda, being the frequency, times x1. This is an eigenfunction for the Laplacian with eigenvalue lambda square. You just differentiate twice with respect to x1 and you get the function itself. Um, of course, I need this to be 2 pi periodic, so lambda ne needs to be long here to 2 pi z, so that this makes sense as a function of, on the torus, which is what makes the spectrum discrete. And what happens with this function is that if I take my curve h to be this vertical strip here, so h is the curve x1 is 0, which corresponds to this curve in the torus. What's going on here is that when you average the function along h, this function is simply the function constant equal to 1 there. So you just pick up 2 pi. You pick up a constant. Now, this is a very specific example in what What's happening here is that the functions, they are constant along vertical lines. Uh, or put in other words, all the actions for your function is happening in this direction, right? This is how they are oscillating. They will oscillate like this. And actually, whenever you have this behavior, whenever your functions propagate only in the normal behavior to h, it is that we are going to have maximal averages in this sense. But that's getting ahead of what I'm planning on doing in the next slide, which is just giving you um, the settings in which any information is known. 
So this is the main question for the talk, trying to understand the averages. And just remember that this is also a talk about value distribution, because you get to pick your sub-manifold to be just a point. OK, so these are some results. I'm going to start with what's known as surface. That's this side of the slide. Uh, on a surface, in 82, 83, Good and Hedge have independently proved the same result, which is that these averages, they are bounded above by a constant. That's this big O of one notation. And in order to do that, they needed the surface to be hyperbolic and the curve H to be a geodesic. But it turns out that this is not needed, actually, as an assumption. And uh, 10 years later, Steve Seldich proved that on any manifold that you may choose, you can do an average over a submanifold H, whose co-dimension is K. That's the, uh, I'm going to denote throughout the talk the co-dimension of your submanifold K. And what happens is that these averages are going to grow at most like a constant times lambda to the K minus 1 over 2. That's this notation here. And the talk takes place always as the eigenvalues lambda, they are going to infinity. Every time that you see this notation, I'm just saying, when the eigenvalue grows, uh, you're bounded above by a constant times whatever is in the parentheses. So Steve Soldich, he proved this result, which is telling you that you always have this upper bound. This is big O of lambda to the k minus 1 over 2. And as I was saying here, k is going to be the co-dimension of h. And, um, and so what the talk is mainly about is when is it that you can saturate this upper bound? When is it that you're going to have maximal averages? So you reach the lambda to the k minus 1 over 2 growth. Um, when h is a point, this question uh, was studied way before than Selvich's work. Uh, it started with the work of, Le of Leviton, and then Abakumovic and Hormander generalized it. And what you get is, when you're a point, the co-dimension is n. So you just get lambda to the n minus 1 over 2. That's an upper bound for the subnorms of the eigenfunctions. OK. Um, so as I was saying, the talk is, when is it that we are going to saturate this upper bound here? Um, or you can think of it as, when is it that you can improve it to a little O bound? And the first result in this direction is by Chen and Sog. In 2015, what they showed is that these averages are actually a little low of one, so they will go to zero as you expected at the beginning because the eigenfunctions are oscillating like crazy. But they were, all, they were all only able to prove it when the manifold has the surface, has negative sectional curvature, strictly negative, and the curve H is a geodesic. And actually, in this setup, uh, so Xi and Zhang actually improved this rate of decay, and instead of saying chest goes to zero, they were able to prove that it's bounded above by a constant over square root log lambda. Uh, so they can actually control the rate of decay to zero. And the same was proved by Wyman in 2017, so last year. And what he was able to do was to relax the conditions of on H. H no longer needed to be a geodesic for him, so now H is a curve that has to satisfy some curvature assumptions, namely it has to avoid two critical values. But I don't want to get into that. Because the talk takes place on this side, I want to work on a general manifold and on a general uh, sub-manifold. And in this setting, uh, what we know is the following. We know that you can go from a big O to a little O uh, as long as the following condition is satisfied. So what's going to happen here is that we are, we are working within the cosphere sphere bundle, S star M. I'm denoting the points here by X, C. So this is position and momentum. And uh, so you have your curve H here. And I want, what I want to do is to understand what's the set of unit conormal directions. So I'm going to be looking at all these vectors that are perpendicular to H. This is, this is what I'm denoting by n star h. But I'm going to normalize them to have unit length. So s n star h, OK? That's the orange set that appears right here. So you can go either way. So this is just the set of all unit conormal vectors to h. 
when h is just a point, then this is simply the fire at x. So as x star m, this is what s n star h looks like. These are just all the vectors that are normal to x and unit length. And uh, the idea now is that what you, what Wyman needed to do in order to control these averages was to look at the set of looping directions that are conormal to h. That means that I start uh, at a point on h with some velocity that after some time will make me loop back to h. So the geodesic flow brings me back to h, and it brings me in such a way that I am conormal to h. So I'm perpendicular to h when it brings me back. So that's this set here that I'm denoting as mathcal L. So these are all the points that are uh, conormal directions to h that loop back to h after some positive time t. And um, in the space of unit conormal directions, this is a subset of the cold sphere bundle. So you can use this as a metric to to input a volume form here. So this inherits a volume form. That's this sigma here that I'm writing. And when the measure, the volume of the set of looping directions is zero, Wyman was able to prove that, he, that these averages are not going to be saturated. So you never reach the lambda to the k minus one over two growth. You just go slightly slower and you get to a little low. Are there any questions before I move on? This is a setup, and I need to I need to know if you understand the problem, or if. Question: Can you see the volume problem? H, which here that is suddenly Yeah. So I have a Riemannian metric in the cotangent bundle. There's a Saki metric, and it it induces a metric here, and it induces a metric on my submanifold, and I just use. When you the H figure out, you could have. L. What is this set here? Okay. Oh, if it's r no, I don't know how it looks like. It's just a subset of S star M. Yeah, it can be nasty. No, yeah. it's just the volume. Yeah. Yes. No, I, I can actually cross H in some weird direction and then come back normally as long as I come back at some point. Yeah, I don't care if it's the first time that I touch H. At some point, I have to come back. Yeah, normal. When I, when I leave H and when I come back after some time, yes. OK, so these are the results known. And what we want to do is to, what this talk is about, actually, is I'm going to present you with a set of results and techniques that are going to recover all these results and extend them, actually. Um, uh, so hopefully, by the end of the talk, uh, you'll have an idea of how to deal with eigenfunctions. That's a new way of looking at the, uh, different eigenfunctions. And if I'm lucky, I'll get to talk about these logarithmic improvements. Uh, usually, people to get logarithmic improvements of this type when working with eigenfunctions is they ask for no conjugate points or negative sectional curvature. They lift everything to the universal cover and they work with the eigenfunctions there because you can propagate thi uh, things by logarithm. Yeah for logarithmic times, so that's how they get improvements for the eigenfunctions. Um, towards the end of the talk, I'm going to present results with logarithmic improvements. We are going to actually recover these results in particular, uh, but the techniques that we are going to use to get them are completely different. These are just going to be techniques about what happens when you restrict your eigenfunctions to tubes around geodesics, okay? and you just keep track of what happens uh, along these tubes depending on what the dynamics of your geodesic flow look like, what will happen with these tubes, and what will happen with the mass of your eigenfunctions. Okay, so now I want to talk about Gaussian beams. So in this slide, I just want to give you the heuristics of what's happening behind uh, being able to saturate these uh, bounds, these upper bounds. And in order to do that, what I'm going to ask you to believe, just for this slide, is that one can decompose eigenfunctions into a linear combination of Gaussian beams. So I'm going to define what I mean by that. So suppose we are on the sphere, but you can build ga Gaussian beams on any manifold, as long as what you need to have is a closed geodesic. So this is my closed geodesic gamma here. 
And uh, what a Gaussian beam is, is simply a sequence of Laplace eigenfunctions functions that will concentrate heavily along a closed geodesic. So here for this one, these eigenfunctions will uh, be very near, uh, so they will look like zero at the poles. And along this geodesic, they will, look, they will blow up. Um, so they are oscillating, right? So they actually go like this. Picture them blowing up along the equator like this. The way in which they blow up is prescribed though. So this height here is like lambda to the one quarter. And they blow up around a band that's centered at the equator. And this band has he uh, height like lambda to the minus one half. On the sphere, this sequence of Fagan functions is called the highest weight spherical harmonics. But as I was saying, you can build them any time that you have a closed geodesic. You can find a sequence of Fagan functions that will localize uh, along your closed geodesic. And here in the slide, what I'm showing you is just the profile of this Gaussian beam, of one Gaussian beam. So here is the peak that I was showing you over there. So I was saying in this picture, the eigenfunction is peaking like at most like lambda to the one quarter. So that's this peak up here. And then at the base, you have lambda to the minus one half, which is the width of this band. And as I was saying, they, can, they are oscillating along your geodesic. That's this oscillation that I was trying to draw in this direction. And they can they go up and down like an eigenfunction. So every one over lambda uh, loops, they go up and down. And if you believe just for this, just during this slide, that you can decompose an eigenfunction into a linear combination of Gaussian waves, what you want to do is to say, OK, I'm going to start with my curve h. And I'm going to try to grab a Gaussian beam and run it across h and see if I can do anything with these averages. So you want to maximize the averages. And uh, in this, for example, the way in which I'm positioning h there would correspond to grabbing an h like this here in this picture. And what's happening when you do that is that these oscillations, they are happening in this lambda to the minus 1 half band. So they are going to cancel each other when you average the eigenfunction along h. So when you look at what happens with these averages, they are going to go to zero faster than any polynomial in lambda. That's what this notation lambda to the minus infinity means. And uh, what we need to do is to remember to normalize them to have L2 mass equals 1. Just one Gaussian beam is, of course, not enough to saturate the constant upper bound that I'm trying to achieve. So you say, OK, for sure I cannot put it like this because I'm not getting anything. But if you put it perpendicular to H, Right? If now you go with your curve H and you put it perpendicular like this, then what happens is that you're going to pick up this contribution when you average along H. You're going to pick up uh, the area under the graph, which is like lambda to the one half times lambda, sorry, lambda to the one quarter. Does it say one quarter? Yes. Lambda to the one quarter times lambda to the minus one half, which is this lambda to the minus one quarter that you can read here for the average. So this is still going to zero. It's not achieving the constant upper bound, but it's quite good because we picked up something. And what I can do now is instead of using just Gaussian, one Gaussian beam to ask my eigenfunction, I'll use two. And now what I'm doing is I'm duplicating the average over the curve. All I need to do if I'm going to do that is to keep track of the fact that the L2 norm changed now. If they are spread apart from each other, at least like I need them to be as far away from each other as this lambda to the minus one half here, which is the width of the bound, band where they are supported. If that happens, then these two beams, they are going to be orthogonal to each other. So when you compute the L2 norm, it's going to grow like square root two. And uh, if I put 3 instead, you get a square root 3 here and a 3 times the average. And then you quickly realize, OK, if what I want to do is to hit this upper bound. What I need to put is as many Gaussian beams as I can fit along this curve while still keeping them orthogonal to each other. And that's what you do. You just put as many as you can, which is lambda to the 1 half 
because they are spread apart like lambda to the minus one half, and I, want, I do not want them to cohere. I want them to not collide. And when you do that, what happens is that the L2 norm grows like lambda to the one half, and the averages, they grow like lambda to the one half times the area I had under this bump, which was lambda to the minus one quarter. So now these two quantities are lambda to the one quarter. And if you remember to average the eigenfunction so that the L2 mass is one, not this lambda to the one quarter here, then that means that this, the averages for these normalized functions will be constant. So this is how I get to saturate my upper bound. And I just need to put as many Gaussian beams as I can in the direction that's perpendicular to H. And what this means, if you think of this in terms of your eigenfunctions, is that your eigenfunctions, if you want to saturate the, up, the upper bound, they just need to be orthogonal to H. Anything happening for the eigenfunctions has to happen uniformly along H. I needed, I needed to fill it first, and also in the normal direction to it, which is exactly what was happening here in the torus example. In the torus example, the sequence of eigenfunctions that we built were only moving in the normal direction to H. That's, what, that's where all the action was happening. So this is what you have to keep in mind. If you want to saturate these averages, all you need to do is to grab your eigenfunctions and make sure that they are uniformly distributed along H, but all the action for them is happening in the normal direction to H. Okay, so now, um, what I want to do is to talk about how is it that we are going to relate the, the dynamics of the geodesic flow with the behavior of the eigenfunctions. And a very convenient way of doing this is to use the effect measures. Um, so I'm going to explain what a defect measure is. Uh, a defect measure is a probability measure that you put in the unit code sphere bundle. It's a measure here. And what it does is it's associated to a sequence of eigenfunctions, and it's defined in the following way. I'm going to say that mu is a defect measure for this sequence if what happens is that for any operator A, and here this notation means any pseudo differential operator on M, but if you're not aware of what that means, and I do not want to define what it means, uh, just think of a differential operator on M. And what it has to happen is that for any oper uh, pseudo differential operator on M, when you apply your operator to your eigenfunction and you do the inner product in L2 with the eigenfunction itself, then this inner product, as the eigenvalue grows to infinity, needs to converge to the integral over the unit cosphere bundle uh, of the principal symbol of your operator with respect to the measure mu. And this needs to happen for any operator that you may pick. This is how we define a measure that's, associa that's associated to the sequence of eigenfunctions. So this measure is going to capture how the eigenfunctions are going to behave in, the, in high energy limits. Now, for full disclosure, we don't know anything about these measures. We know very little, actually. Uh, this is a big branch in micro-local analysis. Try to understand what's the, that's, what's the set of defect measures that you can get. Um, but I'm going to tell you a couple of things that we do know. So for example, if you start with a sequence of AGM functions, then we do not know if there is a defect measure associated to it. But what we do know is that you can extract a subsequence of AGM functions that will have a defect measure associated to it. And that's my first point here. And this is something that we are going to use because I'm trying to understand when is it that these uh, averages are going to be saturated, when the upper bound is going to be saturated. So I'm going to say something like, if I, if I have a sequence of AGM functions, that's saturating me my upper bound, then I can extract a subsequence that will have a defect measure associated to it. And uh, the second property, which is the interesting one, which is the one that's going to keep track of what the geodesic flow is doing, is that these measures are invariant under the geodesic flow in STRM. Uh, so we have this measure that has both information of what the geodesic flow is doing and what the sequence of Hagen functions is doing. Just so that you have an image of how these things look, in this torus example, what the defect measure looks like is a delta mass in the one zero direction for the frequency variables. So this vector here is the vector one comma zero. And then the Lebesgue 
uh, measure on the torus in the x variables. So what this measure is telling you is that my eigenfunctions, they are going to be uniformly distributed in position, but any action happening in the momentum variables is happening in the one zero direction, which is what was happening here in this example. For the Gaussian beam, the measures look like a delta mass along the geodesic. So just grab the closed geodesic that you have, lift it to the cosphere bundle, and then the measure is just the delta mass along the geodesic, which what's saying is that your sequence of eigenfunctions is only concentrated along this closed geodesic. That's where all the action is. Outside this geodesic, you're basically zero. There is nothing that your of your eigenfunctions that survives in the higher energy limit. And what we are going to do now and, uh, is to grab these measures and to restrict them to the set of unit conormal directions on H. So what I want to do is I want to define a measure here in, the, in S and star H. And the way in which we are going to define it is you're going to give yourself a set A, okay? So you're going to start with a set A in S and star H. And now you're going to flow it out using the geodesic flow. You're going to flow it out four times, uh, say, delta into the future and delta back in the past. And so that's my next slide here. You grab your set A in S and star H, and you just flow it using the geodesic flow for times smaller than delta. Delta is a number that you fix, positive number that you just fix beforehand. And what you do is you measure the volume with respect to your defect measure mu of this set. And then you divide by one over two delta. This definition actually is independent of the delta that you pick. I could have written a limit as delta goes to zero in front of this definition and it would go. But I just want you to have a picture of how this measure looks like. So in order to induce a measure on S and star H, you just grab your set, you flow it out, and you, you use your defect measure to understand the size of this set after you flow, uh, yeah. So now, now I'm going to start presenting the results that we have. You are going to assume you have a sequence with a defect measure, and you are going to decompose it into two pieces. One that I understand, which is the volume measure on the set of unit conormal directions, and one that's mutually singular with respect to it. F is just the density here in front of the volume, the, de the derivative, if you want. And the first result that we proved is that you can control these averages in a very specific way from above. So there exists a constant that depends only on n, the dimension of the manifold, and k, which is the co-dimension of the submanifold, uh, such that these averages are bounded above by that constant times lambda to the k minus 1 over 2. And now this integral here comes, which is quite specific. You're just integrating the square root of your density with respect to the volume form, and then some error term. So there is a couple of things that you should note. The first one is that constant times lambda to the k minus 1 over 2. This is exactly Seldich's result. This is this upper bound that we are just recovering now, only that with a very specific constant, right? We, I'm telling you that the constant, it only depends on n and k and the integral of your density, OK? The second uh, comment that I have regarding this is that so that you can understand what's happening in the two examples, when you're working with the torus, the function f becomes a 1. So actually, this is uh, your upper bound. While in the case of the Gaussian beam, the function f is a 0. So this term dies. And you cannot have maximal averages, which, is, which was, was what was happening with the Gaussian beam, as I was showing you. You have cancellations if you put, no matter which h you put, so they go to zero. Um, but this tells you way more than what, I'm, uh, what I just said. What this tells you is the following, that if you want to saturate your maximal, your upper bound, then what happens is that this term cannot be zero. Your function f cannot be zero, which means that the function mu h, sorry, the measure mu h and the volume measure cannot be mutually singular if you want to have maximal averages. 
it just cannot happen that the two measures be mutually singular. So this is just an observation because on, on this observation will rely all the information that I'm going to give you in the rest of the talk. Um, so if my sequence has maximal averages, then the two measures cannot be mutually singular. And here I want to make a point of the fact that we do not understand these defect measures well enough to say anything. Uh, so I need to get rid of my defect measure. And that's what I'm going to do in this next slide. So with Jeff Galkowski, we were like, okay, what can we say about these defect measures that will actually get rid of what the defect measure is? And we started thinking, okay, perhaps we can understand the support of the measure. So remember at the very beginning when I was showing you the set of uh, geodesic loops that were normal to H and would come back normal to H, which, and the condition that Wyman needed on this set was that the volume of the set needed to be zero if you didn't want to have maximal averages. Well, we found out that actually in order to understand this problem, you need to look into a subset of this guy, which is the set of recurrent conormal directions. So these are all the directions that start conormal to H, that will loop back to H, being conormal, but actually if I start with this direction, I come back infinitely many times to H being normal and arbitrarily close to the direction that I, that I started with. That's what I'm going to call the set of recurrent conormal directions. And what we were able to show is that this set is what has full measure for me, nothing else. If I want to understand my defect measure, all I need to do is to understand it on this set. And this is great because now I have the following result. Remember that we were saying that in order to have maximal averages, mu H and sigma couldn't be uh, mutually singular. So this implies the following result, which is that if I know that the volume of Rh is zero, and now there is no longer a defect measure in this statement. If I know that the volume is zero, then I cannot achieve my maximal averages. And the reason for this is because you're finding a set, the set of recurrent directions, that has a zero measure for sigma, but full measure for mu h. So you're finding this set that's making the two measures mutually singular as soon as you impose this condition. So then you cannot have maximal averages and then you get this little low. So this was the first result that we proved, uh, which as I was saying, it's quite nice because you don't have the effect measure, but it wasn't as happy because we do not work in dynamical systems and we did not know how to check this condition at the beginning. So now you have this volume measure and the set of unit conormal directions and you have this set of recurrent directions and you need to understand when the volume of that set is zero. So in, this, in the next slide what I'm going to do is to show you all the settings in which we were able to check this condition. Um, so in all the following settings you have that the volume of the set of recurrent conormal directions is zero which implies this little low averages. The first example is when you are working on a manifold that has constant negative curvature and H is then is a manifold. Then we actually went in and checked by hand that the volume of the set of recurrent directions was zero. The second setup is that of a surface with geodesic flow that's an awesome. I can grab any curve there, look at the set of recurrent conormal directions and show that it has volume zero. I am sure that this result should be true on any manifold with geodesic flow that's an also, and on any submanifold, but we just have no clue how to approach this problem. Uh, so this is an invitation. Um, the, second, the, the next case is when you have no conjugate points. And here we were using the implicit function theorem a bunch of times, so we, knew any, we had to impose this condition on the dimension of H. Uh, the dimension of your submanifold cannot exceed n minus 1 over 2, n is the dimension of the manifold. When you're working with no conjugate points again, but now you look at the other extreme case where the dimension of the manifold, the, of your submanifold is n minus 1, so now you're in the geodesic sphere case, we were also able to prove it. And then if you work in the intersection of an also geodesic flow with non-positive curvature, so in this intersection here, and H is totally geodesic, we were also able to show it. But again, we do not work <laughs> in dynamical systems, so I'm pretty sure that all these things can be improved a lot. In any case, 
this is as far as we went working with defect measures. Defect measures are these limiting objects that record what eigenfunctions are doing when the eigenvalue grows, but they don't capture anything of the growth of um, convergence of your eigenfunctions to a limit. Uh, so if you want to get improvements on these little low upper bounds, you cannot choose defect measures. But uh, so what we did with Jeff Kalkowski was to try to get the logarithmic upper bounds, because this is actually recovering all the results that I was showing you in the first slide, all the little low bounds. But there were some results with a logarithmic improvement, and we wanted to get them. So the rest of the talk is about this logarithmic improvement, which is actually what I think is the best part of the talk, because it's really understanding what's happening with the eigenfunctions along geodesic tube, tubes. It, for, it doesn't use defect measures at all. So the idea is that in all these setups, we were able to show that instead of a little low, you can actually write a square root log lambda. I avoided to put here the case of constant negative curvature, because we did not check the details that you can get the logarithmic improvement, but it has to be true again. The point is that the rest of the talk is on how to get this logarithmic improvement, and what I'm going to do is to actually make it take place in this setup, where h is just a point. All the results work for these submanifolds, but for the rest of the talk, h is going to be a single point, and I'm going to be talking about distributions of values of eigenfunctions, so that you have an easier picture of what's going on with the second functions. Because picturing the set of unit conormal directions is much easier. It's just the fiber on X. Okay. So what's known uh, about the values of the eigenfunctions at a point? So H is just a point. And as at the beginning I was saying that you can look at the set of loop, looping directions that are conormal to H, but here is just looping directions, right? The set of unit conormal directions is just the entire circle here. And whenever the measure of the set of these looping directions is zero, then Sogan and Seldich in 2002, they proved that uh, the values at X cannot exceed lambda to the n minus one over two. Remember that in general, we had this upper bound with the big O. So they just improved it to a little low when the volume of the set of looping directions is zero. Uh, actually, this is also true if instead of looking just at, at the set of looping directions, you look at the set of recurrent directions at x. There. Uh, and this was proved by Stock, Toth, and Seldich in 2011. So it just, if you're only studying uh, supremums of eigenfunctions at a point, all you need to do is to understand the volume of recurrent directions at that point. And uh, the logarithmic improvements were proved way before these two other results. They were proved by Berard. And what he needed was to have no conjugate points. And then he gets a logarithmic improvement here. And the reason for this is, as I was saying at the very beginning, he would lift to the universal cover, be able to propagate things for logarithmic times, and this is how he would get the logarithmic improvements. We have a very good description of what the wave uh, kernel looks like in the universal cover when you have no conjugate points. Um, how, what we were able to prove with Jeff Galkowski is the following result, which allows for conjugate points. You can step, you can choose your submanifold to be a point that self-conjugate. And by that, what I mean is there is a geodesic that come back, comes back to the point, and there is a Jacobi field that's zero at the beginning, non-trivial, and then when it comes back to the point of origin, it's zero again. That's what I mean by self-conjugate. Um, the sphere is the worst setup for conjugate points, right? Because you have the maximum number of linearly independent Jacobi fields uh, that will vanish at the point that are linearly independent, right? So in the sphere, you have n minus one linearly independent Jacobi fields that will be zero at x and come back at x after some time and, be, and vanish again. That's when you say that uh, a point is self-conjugate with maximum multiplicity. And this is exactly what I cannot be in order to be able to state this result. I cannot be a pole in this sphere. As long as the point that you pick is a point that's not a point that's self-conjugate with maximal multiplicity, 
then I get the logarithmic improvements. So now I'm allowing my manifold to have conjugate points. They just cannot look like poles in the sphere. I just cannot have all my geodesics looking, looking back at the same time. That's what we are avoiding, basically. And what I wanted to do is to give you an idea of how one goes about proving a result like this using Jacobi fields. Um, so the idea is as follows. We are looking at the set of unit conormal directions, so the, the fiber at x. And what we are going to do is to look at geodesics that are running away from x. And we are going to build tubes around these geodesics. And these tubes are going to be super thin. The radius is going to be like lambda to the minus epsilon. So the radius is going to go to zero as lambda grows. So these are tubes that are shrinking uh, depending on the eigenvalue of your eigenfunction. And you're going to just consider a bunch of tubes that are emanating from x. And uh, this is the first result that we proved. So you can control the value of your eigenfunction at the point x by a constant times lambda to the n minus 1, which is, again, the correct, correct power. And uh, so what we picked up here was the radius of the tubes to the power of n minus 1 over 2. And then a sum of the masses of your eigenfunctions when you restrict them to the tubes. That's what this thing is. I'm summing over all the tubes, and I'm res what I'm summing is the L2 mass of the eigenfunctions restricted to the tubes. Now, when these tubes are living in phase space, when I say that I restrict the mass of the eigenfunctions to the tubes, I'm operating in phase space, which means that what I'm actually doing is I'm building a cutoff function in phase space for my tube, and then what I do is I quantize that cutoff function, I turn it into an operator, and I, got, I apply it to my eigenfunctions, phi lambda. So this is what it means to micro-localize the eigenfunction along a tube. That's how you do it. And uh, so if I can control the mass of the eigenfunctions along the tubes, I can control the subnorm. And what, I mean, this is not a lot of information if you cannot control the mass of the eigenfunctions along tubes, but uh, this is the nice part. I, I can divide my tubes in two classes, good and bad tubes, where by good what I mean is I'm going to say that my tubes are good and I'm going to put them together in this union if what happens is that this union is non-self-looping for logarithmic times. So I just grab the union of these tubes, unit length tubes, and I let them run under the geodesic <coughs> flow for logarithmic times. And if they don't come back to the original union, I'm good. They are good. Those are my good tubes. And then the other ones that do look back, those I'm calling bad here. And what we were able to do was to control this part here, the sum of the masses of the eigenfunctions, by this parenthesis here. What, and what this thing says is the number of bad tubes is raised to the power of one half. This part you can easily get by splitting the sum into two pieces, the good and the bad part, and just taking Cauchy Schwartz. What you pick up is the number to the one half of bad tubes times this, which is an upper bound for all the terms. The nice part about this is that I get the number of good tubes to the one half, but with the logarithmic improvement. So you may ask, how is it that you get the logarithmic improvement? And the idea goes like this. So if I have just one tube, and I compute the mass of my eigenfunction restricted to that tube, that mass is going to be smaller than the mass of the entire eigenfunction on my manifold. So now what I'm going to do is to propagate it once, Okay, I, can, I get to do that using a Gorab's theorem, uh, which says that the mass is going to be preserved. So now what I know is that this, uh, the mass along those two tubes, which is this number on the left, is bounded above by the mass of the entire eigenfunction. And I can apply a Gorab's theorem as many times as you want, three times if I want, although as long as I cannot, I cannot run for times that are larger than logarithmic times. So I run it for logarithmic times, and then I get that logarithm of lambda times the mass of my initial tube is bounded above by the total mass of the eigenfunction. This is how you get the one over log lambda improvement that when you take the square root becomes this thing here in the denominator. 
So now I have my a point. I create these tubes. And what you need to do is to put a dynamical condition on your, uh, on, uh, with respect to the geodesic, how their geodesic flow behaves with respect to that point, that should help you distinguish which tubes are good and bad for you. And uh, so in my last slide, uh, I'm going to show you how we did that when we imposed this non-self-conjugate non-self-conjugacy condition with maximal multiplicity. So this is my last slide. Uh, so here we are going to build good and bad tubes. And we are going to assume that x is not self-conjugate with maximal multiplicity. Okay? So the idea goes like this. I start with my point x. This is a proof by picture. I start with my point x. And suppose you have a geodesic that loops back to x. Okay? I needed to spread them in the picture, otherwise this would look crazy. Um, along this geodesic, I may be a self-conjugate point. So along this geodesic, there may be a Jacobi field that's zero over here, runs along gamma, and then vanishes again at the end. I may have one of those. But since I'm not maximally self-conjugate, I know that I have one Jacobi field that will start being zero at x, and it will rotate along gamma with some weird shape. And at the end, it will not vanish. This is what I know. I have one Jacobi field like that. Which means that if I start with a tube that points in the direction of this, uh, of this Jacobi field, the good Jacobi field, this tube is going to start at x. It's going to rotate with my Jacobi field. But once it gets close to the final point for my geodesic, it will have spread apart from the point x, simply because it doesn't vanish. The Jacobi field doesn't vanish there, so my geodesic moved away from x. So this is a good tube for me. This is a tube that does not loop back to x. And what happens here is I'm going to look in a neighborhood of that point. I'm zooming in. And uh, this is a geodesic that's going out of the point x. And this is the good direction, the green arrow points in the good direction for my Jacobi field. And it may be that in this orthogonal direction, I have a Jacobi field that starts being zero and at the end vanishes again. But it's, this is a closed condition and it's, so, and it's only one direction. So that means that what I can do is I can cover this direction with very few bad balls and just say that all the other ones are going to be good balls. The rest are just good balls for balls for me. So when you look at what happens here is that all the tubes that start in the balls that were in the good directions are going to end up looping back but not touching x again. I'm going to spread away from x. And I only have these very few bad sets, bad tubes that may loop back to x. But I can control their number. And if I can control their number and say that they are very few, I, get, I can control this part and for the most just get the logarithmic improvement in all the other tubes. And so this is how we got this result, the fact that you can get the logarithmic improvements at the point. And similar results actually hold when you are doing averages over some manifolds rather than just considering one point. Uh, but I do not want to state them here and bore you with them. Um, but this is the state of the art right now. Thank you very much. Again, uh, so if I can get improvements on. Can you get some information about the volume of R H zero? Can you get some information about the volume of R H? Not more than just taking the contrary statement. No, <coughs> not not at the moment. And going in that direction is quite hard for us. And usually we do not think of this like. What happens is that at the moment, computing eigenfunctions is quite hard. 
and when you have weird geometries. We do not know how to do that. So usually all the statements that we try to create are, if I have this geom geometry on my manifold, this dynamical system, then the eigenfunctions will do this, and then I get information on how my quantum particles are behaving, but not the other way around. Because I, in general, we do not know how these eigenfunctions look like. We don't know. Yeah, only on the disk and the square we can compute them. Otherwise, we don't know. Yeah. Yes. Well, let's